Hello everyone, I'm Milo and welcome to my town. 2022 was an interesting year for gaming. I would say that not that many games that I was interested released, but I did have a fun time and played many different things. I wanted to make this video to share my top 10 of games that I played during this year. As I said, not all were released this year, some are older, but I just happened to play this year. In the end, the result of this list ends up being almost all of the games that I played this year, which regarding stuff like multiplayer stuff that I didn't really count. But anyways, let's get onto the list. I'll try to give a brief explanation of each game and why I like them. Anyway, let's begin. Number 10. Her Story and Telling Lies Alright, so from the beginning I'm already bending the rules a little, but there is a reason. Her Story is a game that in its time won many awards because people just found it really interesting. The main thing that you do in this game is just watch video clips of a woman that is being interviewed in a police investigation. There are different interviews and you see the clips out of order. The main gimmick is that you have a search bar that you can use to search specific terms and in return get video clips where that word is mentioned. The whole idea of the game is just to try to piece together the story behind the interviews and see what it is about. Telling Lies is a game made by the same creator and it pretty much follows a similar structure. The main thing of these games is just to try and figure out what exactly happened and you go by your own pace since you are the one listening to the things that they say and you try to become on specific keywords to then search and see if anything comes up. This concept was really interesting to me and I had heard of her story beforehand, I just had not had the time to play it. I do recommend trying them out, they are just like 3 hours long at most, they're not that long since it's just listening to the video clips. Depending on how well you listen and what words you pick up on, it may take you a bit longer to figure out the whole story, um, but that's basically the point of those games. Uh, there's usually a cut point where you have, in theory, learned the necessary information to try to piece the bigger picture together, at which point the game ends or it prompts you to end in both of them. I will admit that for telling lies, it took me a little bit of effort to get to this part because I had seen most of the relevant stuff and I was missing just some stuff. Um, those could be some issues. But I did enjoy these games a lot and they're their own merit. As I said, you can just do them in one sitting. In fact, I would recommend you do them in one sitting so that you can understand better what they are about and not miss any details. But they are interesting experiences and I like them and that's why I wanted to include them on the list. Number 9. Classic Kirby Games Once again, binding the rules by including multiple games into one category. Since this year was Kirby's 35th anniversary and I was preparing for it to launch this channel with the special videos that I made, uh, in order to prepare for those, I did play through some of the older Kirby games, so most of which I had actually never played before. Others I had, but I just replayed them to have a clear picture of their story in case I had I needed a refresher. And just because they're playing fun, and that's what I realized. Kirby games are just really fun. Even some of the older ones, I don't feel like they've aged that much. Um, some of them are really hard, of course, the older ones mainly. But they are really enjoyable to go to, and I was glad I was finally able to experience some of the classic ones that I hadn't had a chance. They are very enjoyable, and I had a lot of fun playing them, even knowing that it was for a video which required a little bit of work, but that was part of the fun of making all of that. That's also why I wanted to include them in the list. Number 8. Root Letter, Last Answer I've already discussed about this game a little bit in this channel, and trust me, you'll see a little bit more of it. This is a visual novel that, in this specific version of Last Answer, has an option where you can use a drama mode that features real-life factors and uh, settings for the background. Uh, because of this small detail, uh, it really resonated with me and I enjoyed it. The story of it is fine, I'm not gonna say that it's anything incredible or fantastic because that's not really the case. It is cool, it is enjoyable, it is okay. I wouldn't say it's gonna win over everyone, but I did enjoy it and it lets you see like a little bit of the town of where it takes place thanks to the fact that it has the real settings on it. Um, 
give it a try if you like visual novels. As I said, I have a video on it, so if you want to learn more, you can check that one out. Number 7. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition Xenoblade has been a franchise that has been gaining a lot of popularity in the past couple of years. Some due to Smash, others due to the games just being good. The first one released in 2011 for the Wii, it got ported to the 3DS in 2015, and then after the release of 2, this version of the Definitive Edition released on the Nintendo Switch. I became a fan of this game by watching a Let's Play on YouTube back in 2014, and when it released on the 3DS, I played it to roughly the halfway point of the game, a little bit before that, but at some point I guess I just got too busy with my studies and ended up dropping it and not finishing it. I did however always wanted to finish the game on my own, and when the third entry of the series was announced earlier this year, I knew I had to play Definitive Edition, especially because it holds a new epilogue that adds some of this content that was cut from the original game and adds a little bit of more to the story. I assume I needed to know what happened there in order to fully understand Xenoblade 3 when it released, so I managed to get a copy and play through the game this year. As I expected, the game is truly a masterpiece. It is really good, the mechanics are cool, and it paved the world for what the series would later become. Even though I knew the story, it's still really enjoyable and the gameplay for an RPG, it's really cool. The additional epilogue was an okay addition, it's not that long, and it behaves a lot like the main game, it has some new characters but they're just reskins, but overall it is fine, and if you haven't played this series for an action RPG, it's an incredible one and I heavily recommend it. Number 6, Raging Loop. This one is a visual novel that had me interested for a good while. This game basically takes the communication game of Werewolf and makes it into a visual novel. Just with this premise, I got incredibly interested in it, because I love visual novels and I used to play Werewolf with some friends a couple years back. The game does manage to convey exactly the game of Werewolf, but mixes it with a situation that makes sense of it, and there are many more mysteries to it. I don't want to go too deep into it, because it's a really interesting experience. I'm just gonna tell you that if you like mystery stuff, the game Werewolf and visual novels, this is a good fit for you. I definitely recommend it. Number 5, Splatoon 3. I was originally only going to cover the single player of this game for the list, but I did end up playing a good amount of it, so I want to cover the whole of the game. Splatoon 3 is yet another Splatoon, I guess you would say. However, for the main gameplay of it, knowing that the teaming was Chaos, which was the winning answer in the final Splatfest for Splatoon 2, I can actually completely feel that in the battles. They feel very chaotic, and I don't know if it's because of the weapons or what is it, but I sometimes just playing Torfor ends up in situations where it's really frantic and it's exciting, and I don't really think I felt this way playing any of the previous platoons. Now, multiplayer aside, uh, that's the one that's gonna keep the, getting the most updates, and it already got one. Uh, the single player is what I wanted to focus originally. So let's just briefly discuss about that. The single player campaign of Splatoon 3 is the perfect mix and evolution of single player Splatoon campaigns. It takes everything that went well for 1, 2 and Octo expansion and puts it into motion in this new adventure. You start out a bit with a fake out with some levels that just resemble the first two games uh, story modes, but that just changes after some levels where you are thrown into the real setting. You have a very big hub world divided into several areas, and a lot of stuff to explore on them. You need to keep collecting the currency that the game has in order to open up several areas as you clean up the fuzzy use, and as you explore you get more levels and hidden collectibles. Then the levels themselves take on like the Octo Expansion ones. You have a few options of weapons to clear them with, and it's usually focus challenged uh, that asks for some specific objective. There are a couple of boss fights here and there, uh, some of them were they were okay, there's a bit of fan service for the right audience in there which was really interesting to see. And as for the story, it keeps increasing the overall dark lore that this series is known for. It also leaves a bit of an open end because of the repercussion of its ending, 
so I'm awaiting to see what they do for the DLC that they have planned for the game. Number 4. Shin Megami Tensei 5 The Shin Megami Tensei franchise is a very long standing one at this point. Of course, many would say that Persona is the one that carries it, but the series keeps going even without Persona, with its main line and some of its other spin-offs. SMT5 was a game that was teased and first announced many years ago, and it was kind of in the limbo for a little bit. I guess a lot of Fastlose projects are like this, but it did finally release on November of last year. Now, I have not played any regular SMT titles before this one. I had played Persona 4 Golden, so that was my extent of experience with the SMT franchise. I was expecting something similar in the combat side, but in the story it's where it takes a different turn. SMT games usually have that whole alignment of chaos versus law and sometimes the neutral roots, and they have more emphasis on the demons that are the personas basically, whereas the persona games have the more social aspect focus. This game, I would say, and many would agree, that has kind of a weak story. I was not really feeling it for it, for the main first half of the game. I do say that it picks up in the second half and it becomes a little bit more interesting. However, I have read that is indeed one of the blandest SMT stories that there are out there. I did however enjoy it a lot, especially the combat system. Uh, it is just a joy, it is really well done for an RPG and I enjoyed it a lot as well. It is a nice alternative for the monster collecting genre, especially because this one doesn't focus too much on collecting individual ones and raising them, but you have to keep changing your teams to fit your needs and increase your levels. Even though it felt a bit daunting, I actually did 100% this game, and I had a really good time playing it. I am looking forward to playing some of the other SMT games, I have some in my radar already. But whenever I got time, I do hope to come around those. Number 3 Pokemon Legends Arceus As we're coming down to the final ones, I do want to say that this game was a very special experience, I guess. I've been a Pokemon fan for over 10 years at this point, and whereas the quality of the games has been really in decline and I cannot deny that, I have to admit that it just catches me and I enjoy this game so it's hard for me to let them go. That said, Arceus was a very, very refreshing and much needed change of pace that this franchise has. I know it's catalogued as an RPG, but this feels more like an exploration and stealth game at times. They changed the complete structure of it, of the older Pokemon games. You are no longer a 10 year old that's on its adventure and just gonna take the leak, and no, none of this happens. This time the focus on the game is on truly surveying and getting to feel the Pokedex. In order to do that, we are going to be going to different environments, traversing the land like it had never been done in a Pokemon game before, and bring more action to the otherwise just known as a turn-based combat game. Uh, you have more control of your character, you have actual threats to your character, which is really interesting. And overall, the game is just about trying to get them all, but in a much different environment than ever before. You have actual three-dimensional worlds with different environments and different Pokemon that inhabit them. I guess talking about it doesn't do it too much justice, but it's really a cool experience to do. As I said, it doesn't have that much combat focus or story focus, but rather it's about the exploration and how you want to do it. It is really cool, and as I said, a much needed breath of fresh air for this franchise. I hope they continue this trend with maybe some other regions, if they can continue to do something like this. It would be really interesting, and I would be up for it. Number 2. AI Desomnium Files Nirvana Initiative This is another type of visual novel game, and it's no wonder it's so high up in the list, because I really was looking forward to this one. I played the first AI Desomnium Files games last year, roughly in about June, and while I was playing it, this sequel was announced. I guess there was a perfect time to get into the franchise. Now, something that I did, and I am proud of, is that I avoided every single promotional material that they released for that game. Besides the very basic, you know, cover and main artworks, I knew who the new protagonist was, but I kept myself spoiler-free 
and that greatly improved my experience. Since this is a heavy narrative game, uh, I wanted to know nothing of the story beforehand, and that really, really enhanced my experience of it. For those who are unaware, this is a visual novel that has some puzzle-like elements where you go into people's heads and see their dreams, trying to get information for police investigations that way. Just gonna say it like that, but if you are a fan of the Zero Escape franchise, try these games out because they're from the same creator, it is this franchise that he's now doing after wrapping up Zero Escape. They're really good and I really had a blast with this game, so much that I bought the Collector's Edition for the Switch, even though I played it on PC. That's how much I liked it. <laughs> well, I did have it from before, but you get the idea. Before I move on to the number one, there is one game that I wanted to just keep an honorable mention to, that I didn't include in the list, and that is Pokemon Violet. Well, Scarlet and Violet. At the time of this recording, I have just wrapped up my living deck, which pretty much completes everything that was to do in this game. Um, I don't plan to drop it so early, as I'm playing alongside a friend and they want to do stuff. If there's events, I might participate on those. But, um, well, I have beaten everything in the game. Now, I know the game has glaring issues that cannot be ignored, and I'm no apologist. I know that those are inexcusable. However, I also cannot deny that I had a lot of fun playing the game, especially playing alongside a friend that was playing the other version. We would often chat about what we were doing, our experience, so on and so forth. Now, even if we ignore the performance issues and all of that, the game has some elements that are not that much of my liking, or stuff that's amazing that really shouldn't, because it has been a staple. They're probably gonna sell it as DLC, and that is shady as hell, and I hate it. But, well, that is the course of being a Pokemon fan, I guess. As I said, I didn't include it on the list, especially because it released so late, though I did have some fun with it. Well, now the moment of truth. Number 1, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. When I talked so highly about the first game that I played earlier this year, it was pretty evident that 3 would be really high on this list, and it is. It is the culmination of everything that the past two games did. Uh, it combines them, it combines their worlds, it combines their combat, it is so good. The story is cool, there is some controversy about some people that don't really like them, uh, and also there's some subtext that they leave, and the true meaning of the story is only understood after you understand that, which usually isn't that good. However, I had a blast playing through this game. I wanted to complete as much of it as I could, and I did. I was doing some extra bonus stuff that I took a little break off because I had been playing the game for two months. <laughs> I do plan to come back to it uh, when more of the DLC releases, especially since it's gonna have a story DLC that I'm really looking forward to because it can go either one or two ways. And I don't know which one they're gonna go for, but I am excited to see what they have. And well, yeah, that's it. Uh, it was an incredible game for me. And that's why I can only say that the best game that I played on this year is Kirby and the Forgotten Land, baby! Oh, of course you thought I was gonna skip it, no! Well, Xenoblade 3 may have been great, but I cannot contain my Kirby bias, come on! Kirby and the Forgotten Land, the first fully 3D Kirby game, after 35 years of its inclusion. Oh, the game was just a blast. I was so lucky that my delivery for that game even came earlier, the day before, at like 6 p.m., just as I was wrapping up work and I started playing, and it was such a joy. It's the culmination of the 35 years of Kirby history, blended into a 3D environment, and they managed to replicate it perfectly, and I love it. And I hope I continue. I hope they continue to go in this direction. They had said that sort of the 2D era of here was kind of done, even though we're getting a remaster of a Return to Dreamland next year. But I do hope they continue to improve in this uh, new dimension that they gave Kirby games. You know I couldn't do it. <laughs> and well, that was my top 10 list of games that I played this year. I'm gonna share on the screen right now my list of when I played the games, I have documented the dates and my completion rates for them, or what I did on them. 
as you can see that most of the games that I talked about in here are in that list. Some aren't because they're a bit minor, so they weren't even worthy of mentioning in the list. They didn't make the cut. But anyway, uh, that was it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. I have a lot of more games that I want to play, that I want to continue to play, that I need to pick up and play for the next year. Uh, and I said that I'm doing the channel now, but I'll try to balance making some videos and getting through my backlog because it is a lot and I do not have that much free time. But once again, I hope you enjoyed and keep in mind these are just my opinions, so do let me know what you think and what were your, spe your best games in the comments. And don't forget, you're always welcome in my town. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time.